So now GMS, uh, I mean, sorry, Copernicus is available and uh, the services can be developed. So the services can range from very simple to uh, very evolved, very highly developed. And let me give you a few examples and then let's see what, what are the conditions for, uh, for an efficient and, uh, and powerful service. This is simple detection. There's, there's no big processing. It's an oil spill detection that you can see on radar images. As you can see, the bright, brilliant spot. This is, this is an image of the, uh, the Adriatic Sea uh, near, uh, close to Italy. And on the left side, on this black image, the bright spot is a ship. And you can see that behind this ship, there's this long black trail, which is likely to be an oil spill. And it's black not because it's oil, it's black because the oil will actually, uh, because of its viscosity, will flatten the sea. And uh, if the sea is flat, and then the, uh, the backscattering of, uh, radar, of the radar signal is lower, and so it appears as, as black because there's uh, less signal coming back from this uh, area. But it's essentially direct detection. And, um, and then, of course, uh, coast guards can, can do something with it. A bit more advanced, a bit more sophisticated is uh, flood management, where you can use the images with a little bit of processing to actually map the extent of a flood. And this is an interesting example where another uh, very important uh, characteristic of, uh, of the Copernicus is used. It's not just a sentinel image. It's a sentinel image combined with an image from a Cosmos Chimet satellite, which is a, an Italian satellite. And this shows how indeed uh, we, uh, the Copernicus allows us to bring together the resources of uh, national countries with the resources of the European Union and then put all the satellites data together to provide more information. So there a little bit of, uh, of processing, even more processing. This beautiful image of Vesuvius and the Campi Flegre in, in Italy near Naples, uh, which is a volcanic area where the ground is constantly uh, deforming. And this deformation can be actually observed and measured using this technique of uh, differential interferometry, which I mentioned for, for the earthquake in California, where these fringes, these uh, stripes of colors, are, uh, can be used to measure the, uh, the deformation of the ground with an accuracy which can go down to uh, just a few millimeters. So it's, it's a remarkably accurate mechanism tool for measuring deformation. And, uh, and again, something which can be used by scientists, of course, but which may have a number of uh, uh, commercial applications when deformation is caused not by natural phenomena, geophysical phenomena like uh, vol volcanoes or earthquakes, but are linked to uh, urban development, construction, subsurface activities, mining, and so on. So that's... Uh, that's a level of uh, a, a bit more advanced uh, level of uh, processing, yet not something uh, really so sort of very uh, complex and sophisticated. This is uh, another example of uh, you, the use of uh, Sentinel-1 and other satellites, which is they're a little bit more integrated, which is essentially um, uh, addressing the question of uh, rice crops in Southeast Asia in two streams. Uh, one is for rice production, for improving production and efficiency and productivity, but also for insuring and for an insurance perspective. And that's why Alliance, the, uh, the Swiss uh, uh, insurance companies was involved in this project. Again, this is an interesting uh, demonstration of how um, sophisticated application of satellites requires not just one Earth observation satellite, but a combination of many. M maybe uh, in order to 
understand better the what makes a successful geo service, why it is difficult to develop a geo service, and and what can be the role of satellites in developing or improving or operating geo services. Let's take the exa an example, and the example is the really the archetype of a geoservice weather forecast. First of all, what makes weather forecast possible is the combination of in situ observations, observation on the ground, so we're not starting from satellites, and indeed the weather forecast existed where many, uh, I mean it's been existing uh, maybe for two centuries now, or a bit more, and uh, it didn't wait for the satellites to, uh, to exist. So, in situ observations in the oceans using ships, but mostly on continents, and this was really the problem. I mean, these observations are not distributed all, all over the planet. They're only, they're mostly concentrating in, uh, on continents, and in particular in, in the northern uh, hemisphere. But there are in situ observations, and of course, there's a, a global uh, meteorological uh, observing system, the so-called global observation system, which has a series of geostationary satellites provided by all the larger member states of uh, the World Meteorological Organization, the WMO, and uh, which are all on this uh, geostationary orbits, the GOES satellites from the US, the Meteosat satellites provided by Europe, and then the, the Fenyung satellites uh, provided by China, the one uh, MTSAT provided by Japan. And also there are a series of uh, low Earth orbit satellites in, in polar, quasi-polar, and some of them actually in more inclined orbits like uh, Jason for the oceans or TRMM trim, which is now replaced by the uh, GPM, uh, Global Precipitation uh, Measurement uh, Missions, which are in, uh, in a very low, uh, uh, low inclination orbit. So, in situ observations, satellite observations from GEO, from LEO. And then, of course, models, computation capabilities and models. So um, that's, these are the, the three key components of, uh, of the, let's say, the elements of the infrastructure for the good weather forecast, in situ observations, satellite observations, well coordinated, and uh, computing capabilities, and of course, a good model to assimilate the data. And what you can see on this slide is that since the satellites have, uh, have existed, you can see that over the last 20 years, the number of satellite data which have actually been integrated, which have been assimilated in numerical weather prediction, in other words, in, in, in these um, computer models which allow us to uh, predict uh, the weather, this has uh, increased uh, incredibly and we have now uh, 150 million observations which are processed every uh, I mean half a day uh, to do the, the weather forecast. And it's really this, uh, the introduction of these uh, satellite observations in the model which has allowed us to, uh, to make those uh, incredible progress uh, that we've observed over the last uh, 20 years in, uh, in uh, weather prediction and it, in the, its reliability. And this is well, very well illustrated on, on these curves. Uh, the top curve, the blue one, shows the evolution from 1981 to uh, 2010. This is the, the years and the vertical scale is the uh, uh, reliability of the prediction in percentage. The blue curve is prediction at three days, uh, the red one is prediction at five days, seven days prediction is green, and finally the ten days prediction, which is probably the maximum where uh, we can get today. Ten days prediction is already uh, getting uh, marginally significant. 
And also what's important here is that the upper part of the curve uh, shows the prediction in the northern hemisphere, whereas the lower part of the uh, colored band is the prediction in the, in the southern hemisphere. So let's take the blue curve. What we see is that in the northern hemisphere, uh, the uh, forecast reliability has improved from, let's say, 85% reliability in 1980 to uh, 96-97% reliability, which means that in the northern hemisphere, we, uh, at three days forecast, we have 96%, 97% reliability of the forecast. It's excellent. And, um, and this increase is really uh, linked uh, to satellites. What's even more interesting is that if you take the, uh, the lower part of the blue curve, the um, prediction, the forecast in the southern hemisphere, you see that in 1980, it was so the reliability was 70%, which is hardly significant. It's just a, a, a parenthesis here. In order to make a significant prediction in, in weather forecast, you have to make it better than 60%. The simple way to look at that is, um, is that if you make the prediction that uh, tomorrow uh, the weather is going to be like today, you have a bit more, uh, more than 50% chances of being right. So you have to be above 60% to make significant uh, improvement to this uh, very simple forecast. So you see in the southern hemisphere 70% in 1980 and now 97% same as in the northern hemisphere. And I think this is really the beauty of satellites because satellites are providing evenly distributed observations over the whole planet. I mean they're measuring the northern hemisphere as much as the, uh, as the southern one then the forecast in the south has become as reliable as it is in the northern hemisphere. And this is one of the real virtues of, uh, of satellites. You observe a similar improvement in five days and, uh, and, and again a narrowing of the gap and uh, same for uh, seven days improvement overall and reduction of the difference between the northern and southern hemisphere. Um, so that's, uh, that's really the, should beautifully demonstrate the efficiency of the uh, introduction of, uh, of satellites in, uh, in a well-coordinated global service. And uh, it's thanks to, uh, to this capability, which is clearly globally coordinated by governments and, and big regional organizations, that uh, we now have a weather forecast as a public service, which allows us to uh, forecast where hurricanes are going to land five days in advance and allowing to uh, local authorities to uh, make an alert and to uh, take people to save heavens. And that way, the um, um, an interesting um, indication of uh, how much uh, improvement we've made is to look at what uh, hurricanes, the history of hurricanes in the, in the Bay of Bengal. Um, Twenty years ago, a, a big uh, typhoon in the Bay of Bengal would kill thousands of people. Nowadays, when there's a typhoon, there are still some casualties, there's still a lot of destruction. But at least uh, we, I mean, people are not being killed by thousands as they were in, in, in those days. And that has to do, of course, with uh, better uh, preparation, shelters being, uh, uh, having been constructed, but also excellent forecast four days in advance, which uh, gives uh, enough time for, to the local authorities to uh, actually prepare the people. And the interesting uh, development is that now weather forecasts can become a commercial service. There are more and more industries, more and more companies, which need an accurate local weather forecast. So it's a B2B type of uh, service, but it's clearly developing. One obvious example is uh, windmills, wind farms where uh, a good forecast of the wind is, uh, is needed and is actually needed 
at the height of the windmills, which is usually 100 meters, and I'll come back to that later in my uh, presentation, because um, it's not so easy to actually do that, and satellites alone cannot do it. But um, offshore operations, of course, will need a very good forecast locally, and um, any activities, farming, which is sensitive to, uh, to weather conditions, will require a, a local weather forecast and uh, will be prepared to pay for additional, um, for a local improvement of the weather forecast uh, for uh, their own purposes. So really what we're seeing today is the weather forecast developing as a public service for um, informing uh, citizens, but also for the safety of populations, and as a commercial service for in a B2B commercial service.